as we continue to navigate the COVID-19 crisis, in which we are hopeful we are coming to an end, these have been challenging times for all of us, and including our elected leaders, because as the information changes, they are trying to navigate this world to make decisions based on what is best for us and their community. With us now on the show, let's bring in State Senator Rosemary Bear. She is with the 12th District. Always great to have you. Thank you. I appreciate being invited. I'm glad to see both of you in one place. <laughs> I know, but I will say it was kind of nice to um, get to work in my um, pajama bottoms. <laughs> Yes, we're all appreciative. I'm wearing fuzzy slippers right now. <laughs> right. I will say, I keep telling everyone, I'm like, hey, if you're looking for a great gift for someone, Ugg slippers. They're expensive, but they are worth every penny. They are so awesome. So, <laughs> but sneakers, I guess we'll do. Uh, great to have you with us. We always appreciate your time. Uh, so many things we want to talk to you about, um, but if we can just kind of start off uh, with the push to get the you know schools back open uh, by mid-March, your thoughts on that? Um, I, I have seen an awful lot of schools pushing themselves to get back open, so uh, the challenge of course is to be ready, and that's, that's a big part of our job is to make sure that the districts have what they need to open safely and um, we are, you know, obviously the governor, the, you know, the, the idea is to get back to normal and a lot of people are can't get back to work until their kids are back in school. You know, there's always been a daycare shortage and, you know, it's a complicated issue with daycare and families, we know how that goes. So um, getting kids back to school, as long as we can do it safely is a big push on our uh, economic situation, right? So we're, we're very motivated to make it happen. That being said, um, there, the federal government has offered help in the form of money for school systems to be prepared to do the things they need to do. And the legislature is not doing their best to get all that money out to the schools. <laughs> so we're also kind of part of the problem right now. So at the same time we're pushing on that, we're, we're uh, moving a little bit slowly on the legislative side to get the money through. So why can't you two come together? And we're why talking about the Republicans and the Democrats, and obviously there is a stalemate in Lansing when it comes to the issue of trying to release some of these billions of dollars in the COVID-19 yeah. relief plan. And we're right now still talking about the money that's connected to Trump, not even yeah. the yeah, recent. Yeah, it was approved before he left office. Yeah. Yeah. So this isn't even the money under this new huge relief bill yeah. uh, that Biden just uh, recently got passed. So. Um, with that, why can't the two sides come together? Uh, it's really frustrating, I will say that. Um, so this is federal money. And so federal money should pass right through our hands. The, the way Michigan works is the, uh, the legislature is responsible for allocating dollars, right? That is the way it works in our constitution. Uh, but this is federal money and it's already spoken for, right? This money goes to education, this money goes to rental assistance, this money goes to vaccine. So we should be just pushing it right on through. And the governor did right away at the very beginning of January, put together, here's how I think we should get that money out there, right? Here's a plan, let's just get it out. Um, and the legislature has held it up. So last week, finally, some of it got appropriated. Um, it wasn't, it was about a third of the general fund dollars. So about 550 million for business supports, vaccine, Actually, the vaccine money did not get approved, actually. Um, business supports, some rental assistance, things like that, general general food assistance. Um, the vaccine money got held hostage. So the problem we're having is they're using this money as a weapon to get other things done that have nothing to do with what we need to do for COVID. So um, the vaccine money is being withheld. Um, the, the money for schools so the vaccine money is being held to eliminate governor's emergency powers. 
that's what they're holding hostage. But I will ask, like, one of the things with that, and it's, it's it, she, her powers, the courts have already ruled she doesn't have the powers. We're talking about the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services here. So no, that's and, a different piece. There's actually two parts they're holding hostage. Okay. So, but, but when we're talking about that as well, but we do talk about the, the MDHHS along with Governor Whitmer because we know that even though she, uh, the courts have said she didn't have her executive powers, um, you know, it's now allocated to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, but she's still running the show. They're not doing anything she doesn't want them to do. Um, and one argument is, but we're kind of seeing this too play out with the vaccine, is that every department, every county is different. What happens here in Metro Detroit and Oakland County in your district, completely different than what can be happening at the UP or on the western yes. part of the state. So why not allow the local health departments right. to make these decisions? What's wrong Which with that? Which is what the money is for, actually, that's not being allocated. It is supposed to get distributed out to the vaccine locations. I mean, that's the point of it. Um, and it's being withheld because, and the, the thing that's being withheld from powers, one is a piece of it is from the governors, and it's not the governor, it's our constitution, right? They're trying to change the laws, and this is a 1978 law. But the other part, the, the piece where they are trying to withhold the ability of Department of Health and Human Services to make decisions about schools and whether they should be open or closed. Um, just generally, again, giving the science and medical part of the administration no ability to have any decision making having to do with all our kids um, and instead turning it over to the school boards to make that decision. And but we I really have kind a, of in a way, you know, it did that in a way in which she said, hey, we're going to allow you to reopen, but it's up to the school boards to decide. So um, and the school boards pushed back on us for this. Right. right. I got calls. I couldn't even tell you how many calls from school board members in my district saying, we are not qualified to make this decision. It, right. right. Which is, and again, so, why shouldn't it be up to the county health departments? State worked with the county to come up with the formula to help each county as to leave the decision to the county health department and give them the supports they needed to do that. And that settled it out. Um, but this, this current piece that they're holding, now it's half of the school aid money, $850 million in school funding for Title I schools, no doubt, no less, um, in exchange for making the school boards make the decisions. And that is awful. I mean, honestly, I, people were actually terrified, right? They are not medical people. These are parents who are volunteering their time to help out their kids' school. They don't want to be held responsible for a virus outbreak in their school system. So it's a bad idea. And, you know, Fundamentally, so can I ask you something because I want to um, before I because I would love your um, feedback because you came from the business world. Um, but before I get there, can I ask you um, one question uh, that is tied to some of this money that's being turned down? Is that the science and the data that back some of these decisions should be openly provided to the public? Your thoughts on that? You can get it. You can you can get it. Everyone can go get the data. It's actually all on the website. So it's a little frustrating when people are complaining that the data is not available. It is all available. Um, so I the decision, the, the, the information is, that the governor and her team are using is available on the website because some of it hasn't really been relative. One of it being they were talking about a University of Michigan study. So some of that information isn't um, uh, or, or that they're using doesn't always relate to certain topics. So if it is available, can we question where that information is coming from? Because we all know numbers are about, like you can t twist and turn numbers any way you want to make them, you know, you're an engineer, you're a math person, you get that. <laughs> it's a statistics thing, right? Statistics can be used to measure pretty much anything or say anything you want, right? right. I didn't do good in stats class, you know. <laughs> we weren't allowed to use a computer back then. Now they can use a calculator or I guess yes. computer or calculator. Heck of a lot easier now, I'll say that, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, um, the data, the formula are, the biggest pushback, the real issue is that there's no one hard number, and that's what people keep asking for. What point does this flip, this switch? And then what point does the next switch flip? And, and you know, 
it, nothing is that specific, and that's the real problem. One of the benefits of having all of this data, and most of it comes from the CDC, right? A lot of it, we do get data from the University of Michigan because it's more local, but the real issue is it, it's such a changing situation, right? The circumstance changes, and the, the benefit of having all the data is that we can turn small dials instead of flipping a switch that says we're going from 25% to 50% residents. That's very hard to say, this is the day and this is the number. It, it's not that simple. There's a whole bunch of factors. It's better to go back to the regions and even now the county level, right? More and more, we're depending on the county because it's more local and we can get even more specific. Close bars and restaurants in this area, not that area. Close university access of bars instead of you know that kind of thing. So again, kind of goes back to the argument of leaving some of these decisions up to the county health departments rather than the state health department. Yeah, and it is it is more and more going that way. There's still that high level of, you know, looking at national data on where do outbreaks happen, and it still is in restaurants. The, the biggest group, obviously the biggest group still is over 80. The second one is 20 to 29. The third one is 30, 29 to 39. I mean. We're, we're definitely, and, then, and that's because of restaurants and bars. And, and the, but, but if I can ask you, because I do follow the numbers here in Oakland County, and, and please, I, I'm not trying to be contentious, I'm just trying to understand this, because I think the general public's trying to get here too. And when you track the outbreaks, the number of outbreaks connected, at least according to the data that the state is um, providing, there aren't big outbreaks connected no, we're, to restaurants we're and bars. Doing well. well, no, there have been, absolutely. Well, there have been. But there have been outbreaks in schools, there have been outbreaks in um, restaurants and businesses. And you know, when I go to TJ Maxx and Home Goods, my two favorite shopping places, um, you know, the lines in there are crazy. And you're so much closer connected than you are in some of these restaurants and bars. And so we keep hearing politicians say, we know restaurants and- No, they are. But, well, but the numbers don't show that and are you yeah. saying or well, is it just not being very, no no it's going down is it it's been going down that's why we're now open at 50 percent. but that has been where the numbers are and the difference in the thing that to think about is when you go to a restaurant you sit in one place and you take your mask off staying in one place when you go to the store you move around and air moves around there's a whole different level of risk because of the fact that you go to a restaurant and you sit there um, and then the other piece is drinking. And so bars are way worse than restaurants because of the drinking when you, you just stop here. But that's why the rule of closing earlier, it's really about, you know, how about getting intoxicated because that's when you really are high risk. And you're in a bar and you've had three drinks. That's the scariest, most likely time of getting, you know, it's just kind of, yeah. And it is data-based. And it is getting better. So we just got to keep moving in that direction. Um, but all the data is available. So that's it's just complicated enough that you probably would have a hard time figuring it out, looking at the data yourself. Um, it, you know, data analytics is, it usually uses pretty big computers. So, it's not a, <laughs> so maybe this is more of a communication issue. I think it might be more about communication. And I know now the big push is just get the vaccine out there so we can be done with this. You know, sort of thankfully things are moving faster, right? And, and uh, by the way, I was listening before I came on, and in Oakland County, they do have a prioritization formula that they use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so even though the list is long, because of course the, the doors are open for everybody to sign up, they sign everyone up and you will get a call, but you're, where you are in the list will depend on those other factors, whether you are a high risk or an old elderly or you know, whatever it is. So uh, we, and I don't know about other counties, I just I just think that Oakland County is really doing a good job. and. Uh, glad you're getting out the number to call to get on that list because a lot of seniors as you said don't use websites very well they would rather make a phone call <laughs> plus then someone calls them back too you know yeah they don't have to get mail and, or anything. 
And one thing with that, too, um, we'd like to remind people who, that have put their name on that list, the Save Your Spot list here in Oakland County, if yeah. you are able to get the vaccine in some place other than through Oakland County, please take the time to go on and remove your name from the list because that's less work for the employees over at the health department so that they can continue to help other people and get to other people oh, a little a bit reminder. quicker. That's a good reminder. Um, and the other thing that happened, too, vaccine-wise, was the nursing homes. You, yeah. you were talking about the, the corrections. The nursing homes also have relaxed their visitation uh, rules, and I got to say, it was just delightful to see my mom. Oh. <laughs> when was that the first time you've been able to uh, physically see her? Yeah, for ages. I mean, I go to her window. I'm one of the window watch visitors, so it, it's been cold. <laughs> right. <laughs> was it emotional? Long, you know. What it, was your well, reunion like? It was for her. You know, she's in a nurse. She's, she's there for um, disability kind of thing. So she was happy to see me and happy that we could just walk around outside, which we haven't been able to do. We went for a walk together and just um, it was really, really nice. So, uh, yeah, just another sign of of our improving situation. State Senator Rosemary Bear with us here on the Megacast. She represents the uh, 12th district, which of course includes portions of our area here, including my city of Kiko Harbor, and then alongside uh, Pontiac and um, Sylvan Lake as well. Uh, but uh, for some of these visitations, a lot of it is just peace of mind, right? For the loved ones so that they can physically check to see that their loved ones are okay. It's, you know, well, you know, it's your mom. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Hard to not love that. And, you know, just talking with her, just just, just delightful. And she's, oh, I was thinking about moving, you know, and I'm like, this is a pretty nice day, nice place you're in here. She's just, yeah, maybe I'll stay. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you got to um, have that visitation, but while we are talking about the nursing homes, of course, um, Pete Lucido, uh, you're one of your former counterparts there, but also now the Macomb County Prosecutor, along with journalist um, Charlie LaDuff and uh, another nonprofit organization, they're looking at going after the governor because of the nursing home policy. And of course, uh, Pete is uh, on his own there and he is looking for people and is possibly looking at criminal charges, uh, LaDuff and um, the nonprofit organization, they're suing the Whitmer administration over the data and the number of the datas. Uh, of course, yeah. one of those being that big asterisk that we're seeing about vital records review when the cases come out about the number of deaths here in the state of Michigan. Uh, what's yeah. your response to that? I uh, fundamentally disagree with what they're doing, of course. I think we've had an outrageous number of frivolous lawsuits against the administration through this emergency. But we have consistently been ahead of the game in anything having to do with nursing homes. We've had less deaths, we've had a better job managing it. We have had everybody vaccinated, by the way, for a while now. Um, and. Uh, there was, you know, his, his, there's a thing that's been going on there. There just seemed to be on a rampage about the nursing homes that you know, she made everybody go back there, even though they were sick, and which she never did. There was never, ever a rule in place that said you must accept someone who is COVID positive into a nursing home, ever. They had an option if they wanted to create a separate unit that was safe and passed this inspection and this kind of requirements if you wanted to house COVID people, but there was never a requirement to do that. And I lived through that because my mom tested COVID positive and the place where she was did not have those facilities and they had to ship her out. They couldn't keep her there because they didn't have a separate unit to maintain. So, I, you know, I don't know. There, every That's why every one of these lawsuits that they've started so far has been thrown out of court because there's no base for them. They're always wrong. They're hey. always wrong. And these are just beginning, and of course, uh, this program was kind of based off the one out of New York, but with that, State Senator, if I can ask you, um, because you are very closely uh, connected to this issue, um, uh, but as someone who is a, a reporter in this market for eons, we know that some of these nursing facilities have not had the best of track records in the best of times, but there was a monetary incentive for them to create these COVID HUDs. And what looks good on paper may not be the reality. We still know to you know today, they're still struggling in getting employees as well, 
but um, s the health inspections that were taking place, um, some people have said those inspections were over the phone. They weren't physically going to these facilities and doing surprise visits too. That is key in some of these so that they can find the violations. I can call you up and ask all the questions I want. I can look at a piece of paper. It's gonna look great. Yeah, Is that so the reality? I was actually, because of all my speeches on the floor, I think I was put on the nursing home task force last summer. And so, yes, I think a lot of those things, those very issues were things that we addressed in the task force, including things like inspections. Um, a lot of it was focused on staff because there's, uh, it, you know, pretty severe shortages even before COVID, um, staffing was short a lot of times. It's a low paying position, you know, we have uh, the same problem with all caregiving kind of jobs. We, do, we don't pay what people are worth. And so therefore it's easy, people don't stay, right? If you yep. can get an extra 50 cents an hour, you're gonna go somewhere else. Um, that just continues now. Even and So one of the things we're trying to figure out at this point is, you know, put some extra supports in place for staffing. We also put a big focus on PPE and some of the other health things we needed to do. but. In the staffing, they've been all getting uh, $2 an hour hazard pay. Um, we're trying to figure out if there's any way we can find to continue that for caregivers in healthcare, but also in education in the preschool, uh, daycare, you know, those kind of jobs, because, it, you know, it, it, people are realizing how critically important these roles are. We have not been paying them what they're worth. And so I think that will make a big difference. You know, we see if we can actually adequately people will we'll see a higher quality of care. That would be so awesome. I think one of the things that has come out of this pandemic is really is high, highlighting the cracks in our system. And this is a huge crack in the system, but we do know that so many of these entities are for profit and that's what they're looking for is the profit and uh, our loved ones are falling between the cracks. Um, so with that, I think that you're a great person to have on that committee and plus because of your relationship with your mother, you understand what so many people are going through. If I can ask you, cause I absolutely love your background. Um, and, but for someone who comes from your background, um, you know, you are an engineer, you're a computer engineer, you're an analyst, but to go into, lawmaking and policy and government. What's been the biggest surprise for you? You know, I really underestimated the um, the, pol the political knowledge that you need. I, you know, as coming out of where I was, my last big company job, I actually had uh, managed a team, a global supply team for General Motors, for the computer company I worked for which is a pretty big deal and requires a lot of negotiation, right? We had to work with our competitors. GM's not the easiest customer. I mean, I thought I am so there. I am a good negotiator. I can do this. It is very different. <laughs> and so I focus a lot on just getting the job done. I came here to solve problems. Here's the problem we're working on. How about we work on that? And a lot of times that works, but underneath you still need to know the politics of the situation. You still need to keep up. And I'm, I don't know if I'm never going to be very good. <laughs> well, you're in your second term now, so you must like it to some degree. I do. Well, you know, you do get to really make differences, right? You get to uh, work on the education stuff a lot, working on the budget, making sure that we're putting money in the right place. And I have a great relationship with my Republican counterparts. I'm the minority vice chair, and he's the chair of the budget committees for our, our education. and. We sit down, we just did it Thursday. We sat down for an hour plus and, and kind of worked through next year's budget, talking about the things that matter and you know, how do we do that. So, so yeah, it feels really great when you're working. <laughs> That's good. You know, and I think too, sometimes uh, the divisiveness grabs headlines, but you guys are working across yeah. the aisle behind the scenes. Yeah, we're getting stuff done. We're, we're, we're taking care of people. <laughs> well, you are definitely a role model for so many people out there and young women, especially. S uh, State Senator Rosemary Bear with us here. She represents the 12th district. Anything you want to touch on that we didn't maybe ask? No, thank you so much for inviting me. I, you know, I'm, I think we have all the good news on the vaccine and now America's rescue plan, $10 billion coming to Michigan. Woo -hoo. 
Right, and right. we should mention too, um, I will say we just had the mayor on for the city of Pontiac last week along with the Chamber of Commerce over there. Good things happening in the city of Pontiac as well. Yeah, I'm really, really thrilled to be able to represent Pontiac and Lansing. And we are doing some very interesting things with Pontiac in the education space and also in business support. So yeah, it's a great place to work. That's awesome. Great place to be. Well, thank you so much for your time, but also all your work behind the scenes. We know that uh, you guys don't always get the recognition that you deserve, but also all the members of your team helping you accomplish what you need to accomplish. So thank you again for your time. Thank you so much.